welcome to our service this morning. As usual, first Sunday of the month, we get to hear a wonderful song from our children, and they're going to sing first for us, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then only a boy named David. All right, guys, sing it. We're ready. Very good. Thank you very much. That's all right. And now um, we have another special treat this morning. We have two students that will be professing their faith in baptism for us, showing the decision that they've made for the Lord. nights ago she came and said brother ron i've accepted christ as my savior and now i'm ready to take the next step and to be baptized to tell my family and tell my friends of what christ has done in my life and baptism is a wonderful testimony because baptism shows that we die to ourselves and that we rise and walk in a new life with jesus christ and this morning is mallory youngman she's not just a student anymore of mine, but she's a sister in Christ Amen. this morning. And I'm very excited this morning to baptize her. So Mallory, based on your uh, profession of your faith and the authority that this church has given to me, I baptize, baptize you, my new sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, we have another young student who came a couple weeks ago, and it was an amazing shock for me. I never had this happen in student ministry. He comes running off office. He says, I need to get saved, and I need to get saved tonight. <laughs> so that was awesome, and I was so glad that Jared came in there, and he talked with me, and he accepted Christ that night as his Savior. And Jared, uh, again, this morning, not only are you just a student of my ministry anymore, but now you're a brother of mine in Christ, and I'm very excited this morning to baptize you. So on the base of your faith, 
and the authority that this church has given me, I baptize you, my new brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The people that's been working on this baptistry is good and warm here this morning. So I told them they had got, they had been blessed. So anyway, but I want to turn the service over to Brother Mark, and we'll uh, continue in our rejoicing in the service this morning. Amen. Well, that, that's a great way to start a service out, isn't it? It's wonderful. It's wonderful to have uh, you all here with us to worship Jesus Christ this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, uh, in the back of the bulletin is a place where you can fill out some information. And uh, you can just place that in the offering plate when it comes around at the end of the service today. And we'll have a record of your visit. But right now, let's stand and welcome one another in the name of the Lord. Just 
just be an anthem that we sing mindlessly as we gather, but that would be something that our hearts cry out throughout the week, through every moment. What is the name? It would be the passion of your church. I love the Father. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
that no matter what we're going through, no matter where we are, no matter how desperate our situation, that healing is in the hand of God. And when you hear his voice of hope, it means you can be delivered today. It means you can be set free. It means you no longer have to live in the darkness and the blinding of your soul.
there's our hope if it does not come from us. God, when we are face to face with the the darkness of our sin, with the, with the helplessness of our own humanity, and we realize that there is no one to save us on this earth except for you, the one who is Lord of heaven and earth. We're, we're helpless before you this morning except for your power, except for your blood, except for your presence with us. And we're so grateful for that. We pray, Father, as we've honored you with songs of praise and worship, as we've, as we've lifted those before your throne, that you would fill our hearts with the word that you so carefully prepared from Pastor Ron this morning. We love you, God. It's in your wonderful name we pray. Where's your hope this morning? Where is your hope? Turn to somebody beside you or around you and say, where's your hope? Find someone else and say, where's your hope? That's the question I want you to think about this morning. You say, why in the world are you asking me that question? Because here's what I've learned. We are hardwired to hope. Every choice you will make, every decision you make, every response you make into a situation, into a relationship, is fueled and motivated by hope. We are always looking for hope. We're always looking for hope. And here's the thing. Hope is an object and it's an expectation. Hope is an object and it is an expectation. Because listen, you're always hoping in something and you're expecting that something to bring you and deliver to you that hope. We're all looking for hope. Hope is an object, and it is an expectation. But the problem is we tend to look at hope in the wrong places, don't we? We tend to look for hope in the places that you cannot find hope. And when we do that, we get mad, we get angry, we get depressed, we get confused. And the reason why is we put our hope in things that was not created to bring us hope. This morning, I want you to turn with me to your, in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59, and the reason is, this is a brilliant passage to find hope. And what's so amazing about this passage? In this passage, this is a very, very dark moment for the nation of Israel. But before I jump in and kind of give you the background of what's going on here, I want to ask just a few questions. When life is hard, when life gets difficult and confusing, when you're dealing with the unexpected, when your story is not turning out the way you thought it should be, where do you run for hope? Where do you run for for comfort? Where do you run for for security? Where do you run and hide? Where is your functional hope this morning? Listen, the children of Israel has been in captivity at Babylon. They're now coming back to Jerusalem, and it is a mess. There is no walls. There is no temple. There is no central government. There is no enforced law. There is no leadership. There is violence. There is massive poverty. There is all kinds of dysfunction going on. And in this moment, in this scene, there is a story of hope. Because here's something I've learned. In our darkest moments, we will, be, we will discover what our hope is. When the darkest moments come in our life, our tr the real truth and the real hope will be exposed. And when it's exposed, that hope will either deliver us through it, or we will be very miserable and very sad. So again, where is your hope? Where is your hope this morning? I want to give you a principle right here at the beginning. And this is something I wrote down. The doorway to hope is hopelessness. The doorway to hope is hopelessness. In other words, the only way you'll ever find true hope is to give up on all those places where you tend to put your hope in the most. 
but it doesn't deliver. The doorway to hope is when you finally become hopeless. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 59. Here we see in verse 1, we see these false accusations that are given to, uh, that they're making towards God here in Isaiah 59. Notice what it says. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ears dull that it cannot hear. Now you may not understand what this verse is saying, but here's what happened. God, through a prophet, is answering this uh, accusation that God's people has brought towards God. In other words, when life isn't working, when life gets hard, when suffering comes in, when the things that we enjoy the most all of a sudden gets dysfunctional, when things are not looking the way we should, guess what happens? We begin to question God. We bring him into the courtroom and we say, God, where is your faithfulness? Where is your goodness? Where is your wisdom? Where is your love? And guys, we're ve- we are very tempted To yell and scream at God. But guys, I want to tell you something. When you allow your heart to begin to question God's goodness, when you allow your heart to begin to question God's wisdom, when you allow your heart to begin to question God's love, let me tell you what begins to happen. You don't run towards God. You run away from God. You know why? Because you're not going to run to someone that you doubt. You're not going to run to someone that you're going to question, do you? When your heart begins to tend to question God, you don't run to Him. You run from Him. I'll just show you a good example of that. Turn with me real quick to Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4. We looked at this. We went through a book through this not too long ago, but I I, I just went back to this because it reminded me when I was reading this story of God. You remember God has put all this stuff in their life. And in verse uh, 6, it says there at the very end, it says, And you did not return to me. Then go down to verse 8, it's the same phrase again. It says, And you did not return to me. And then again in verse 9, it says, At the end of that verse there, of chapter 4, verse 9, it says, And you did not return to me. And then you go to verse 10 there, and at the end of that little section there, it says, You did not return to me. And all of a sudden, God has allowed all this stuff to come into their lives. And, they, and he says, you wouldn't return to me. And the reason God was putting this stuff in their lives, why God put this difficult in their life, is because he was trying to pry open these people's hands and to let go of the hope they put their hope in and put their hope and faith in him, to run in him. So he put these difficulties in their life in Amos. And he says, I'm prying open your hand. I'm trying to make you break a hold of those things you're putting your hope in and quit putting your hope in them, but put your hope in me. Guys, listen, the difficulty of life is not a sign that God is mad at us sometimes. Sometimes the reason God put difficulty in our life is so that he can get us to come to him. Guys, let me tell you, one theologian calls it, and I love this, the uncomfortable grace. That sometimes God uses some difficult situations to get us to return back to him. And that's a hard thing to think about. And God says, listen, and I love this. God's saying, listen, my arm or my hand is not too short that I couldn't reach out to you. And my ear was not too dull that I couldn't hear you. In fact, I could have done any of that. But the reason I didn't is because I was wanting you to return back to me. And then God responds back. Once they accuse, falsely accuse him, then God has some accusations against them. Now, notice what he does here in verse two. Look what he says. He says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. You know, some of the biggest problems in my life, I want to say, are always outside of me. But you know what I've discovered? My biggest problems in my life is what's inside of me. It's not what's outside of me. It's not a location. It's not a people. It's not a particular situation. It's usually inside of me is where I have the most difficulty. And God's saying here that he's not the problem. What he's telling me and what he's telling Israel this morning is that we are the problem. We're the problem. He says, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. 
I love what this man said one time, and I, and I had to write this quote down because I, th- I thought it felt, uh, fit so well. And uh, one guy said this, and I love it. He says, you'll never find someone in a protest carrying a sign with an arrow pointing down that says, I'm the problem. Because the reason we love the protest, he says, is because we get to say, ha ha, you're the problem, not me. Isn't that how we work? Don't we like to blame everyone else? Don't we like to point the fingers at everyone else? Guys, let me tell you, there's not a bad marriage. You know what makes a bad marriage? is somebody in there makes a bad decision. You know what the bottom of that bad marriage is? People. There's us. There's no such thing as a corrupt government. Yeah, there's guys in there that will use that uh, thing, that power for their own personal gain, and they won't use it for the welfare of the citizens. But at the bottom of a corrupt government, guess what you're going to find? You're going to find us. You're going to find people. We're the problem. We have taken God's beautiful, glorious, wisely created institute, and we've made a mess of it. We have made a mess of it. We. Everywhere you go, when you want to run from something, when you want to blame someone else, you can run and you can find a new location. You can find and you can go and get run away as far as you can. But when you end up there, you're going to find, guess what? You're going to find people. You're going to find us. You're going to find us in that situation. And the prophet here uses three words to describe us here this morning in Isaiah 59. He says, we're people of iniquity. We're people who have transgression. And we're people who have sin in our life. That word iniquity means moral uncleanness. In other words, I'd like to think I'm pure, but I'm not. I would like to think that everything I do in life is good, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes I would think that my mind and my thoughts are pure, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes I think my walk is good and pure, but sometimes it's not. That is what we find the word iniquity. Then he describes this as people with transgressions. Transgressions. Now, transgressions is a high-handed rebellion. In other words, it's willingly stepping over the boundaries that you, are not, that you know are there. In other words, it's willing to step over the boundaries of God's rules. In other words, you pull up to a no parking zone and you see that it's a no parking zone, but you do it anyway and you don't care. You're going through town and, it, and you're in a hurry and the speed limit says 30 miles per hour, but you don't care. You're going to go 50 because you're in a hurry. It's when you go to Walmart and you stand in line and you know you got 25 items in your buggy, but you go to the line that says 15 items or less, and you don't care what that sign, you do it anyway. I'm praying for you because I get mad when I see that. I do count. Let me tell you, I do count. I had an incident not a couple of months ago. I was telling our students, I'm in there, I'm in a hurry, and I had 14 items in my basket. I get up to the line, and there's a lady in front of me that has 27 items. And I wanted to be generously tell her something, but I decided, no, grace and peace to you. I'll be praying for you. Anyway, but that's what transgression is. And then he describes this as sin. Sin. You know what sin is? Sin is just simply missing the mark. Sin is just missing the mark. It's falling short of the target. It's this idea that you get a bow and you put in your arrow and you pull it back as far as you can and you shoot it and you always miss the target. That's what sin is. It's called missing the mark. So because there is uniquity in my life, because there is transgression in my life, because there is sin in my life, I've made a mess with God's creation. We've made a mess with God's creation. And we can't blame situations anymore. We can't blame people anymore. We can't blame locations anymore. We can't blame the circumstances around. We got to come to terms that we're a sinful people. And the problem is not outside of us. The problem for most of us in this room is inside of us. And that was God's accusation. And when we finally fall under God's accusation, when we finally realize when we see ourselves as God sees us, something beautiful begins to happen. It's a thing called confession. Confession begins to happen. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 59. Look at verse 9 here. We see the confession beginning to happen. 
Verse 9 says, Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for life, and behold, darkness Behold darkness and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those are full vigors who are like dead men. We are grow like bears. We mourn and mourn like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. This is a description of a group of people who are totally hopeless right now. They're in the dark. The light has been turned off in their world, and they are hopeless. They are hopeless. They describe themselves as groping, putting their hands against the wall. Have you ever been in that room, and you're just walking around, and all of a sudden that, that the lights go out? And then you're trying to find a switch or something, and you're using the wall to guide you? But you don't know really where you're going. You're just using the wall to guide you around. That's exactly where these people are right now. They're hopeless. They're so dark. Their life has come to a point where they're saying, God, I don't even know what to do anymore. There's no light in my life. I am in darkness. I don't know where to turn. I don't know where to go. And that's exactly where these people are. And in those moments... When you are hopeless in your life, when you have come to a place where everything is dark, you come to a point and you have two decisions you make. You're either going to point your finger at other people and blame them, blame your search or situation, blame a place, blame whatever, or you're going to realize that you're a hopeless and you need a Savior to come and rescue you. And guess what happens during that hopeless moment? There is a big confession that happens. And I love verse 12. Look at this. Look at this. Isaiah 59, verse 12. And I love this. They finally confess here. Look at this. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressions, and, de- and denying the Lord, and turning back from following our God. And once they find themselves in a dark moment, they finally confess that they have turned their back on God. They finally have come to the place that said, God, I've got a big problem, and I don't even know what to do with it anymore. God, I'm in a situation, and I'm hopeless, and I have nowhere to turn, and I don't know what to do. But maybe you're here this morning, and you're saying, well, I am in a hopeless situation. But if only you fill in that blank, that will complete me. And I want to tell you, whatever you put in that blank, I want to tell you that's false hope. That's false hope. If you say, well, if I could just get a better job, then life will get a little bit better. If I could just find a man, life will get a little bit better. If I can just find a woman, or if I can just find some money, if I can just get out of this situation, if I can find another church, if I can get out of this, then everything's going to be okay. But I want to tell you, that's false hope. Because guys, listen, creation has no ability whatsoever to be your Messiah. And no person can ever be to you the fourth member of the Trinity, okay? No one can be that. No one can be God. And guys, only God himself can be God. You know, I I hear young ladies and and teenagers all the time say, or I've even heard ladies say, I I just want a man to make me happy. And I want to say, that man's cooked. Yeah, they're supposed to cherish, you're supposed to love them, and you're supposed to do all these wonderful things, but he cannot bring you happiness in life. We're not good guys, I want to tell you, I'll admit it. We'll disappoint you. You know what a biblical view of marriage is? I heard this one time. It's a flawed person married to a flawed person in a fallen world. Is that encouraging? But with a faithful God. That's biblical marriage. So some of you here are in a hopeless situation this morning. Some of you have begun to abandon things that you've put your hope in. Some of you have come to the, to the place where you're starting to realize that there really is nothing in your life that can fulfill you. And God answers that too. Notice what God says here in verse 15. This, this was just incredible when I was reading through this. In uh, verse 15, 
Uh, let's pick up right there where it said this. And I, this just blew me away. Verse 15 and 16. It said, the Lord saw it and it displeased him. Notice, and there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. In other words, there was no one on this earth that could, that could occupy that hope that they were looking for. There was nothing on this earth that God could tell them to turn to. So what the thing I love about it is God just, just doesn't just sit back and say, you know what, you're in a hopeless situation and I can't give you no answer. But God intercedes here, and I love this. Look with me real quick. Look to verse 17. This is where it gets awesome. Or actually, let's keep on reading verse 16 here. Then, I love that. That word then is awesome. That's a great word. I circled that in my Bible because that, that's, a, that's a great thing. Then his own arm, I love that, God's own arm, brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. When you see the arm of the Lord, that's just a sign of a Messiah there, that God is bringing hope. God says, I'm not going to sit back and let you be hopeless, but I am going to bring you some hope in life. I'm going to intercede. I'm going to, I'm going to show you what you need. And two things, when he brings this Messiah in, this Messiah is going to bring two things. He's going to bring justice, and he's going to bring grace. Notice the justice first, verse 17. And he put on him righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of a salvation on his hand. He put on garments of vision of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in a zeal as a cloak according to the deeds. So he will repay wrath to his adversaries, repaid to his enemy, to the coastlands. He will render repayment so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind and the, and the wind of the Lord drives. You know what this tells me? That God is going to deal with sin. God is going to deal with sin. He is going to bring justice to sin. God is not going to ignore sin. And that brings me to fear. And that brings me comfort. It brings fear to me because it reminds me that God takes sin seriously. Listen, how many of us stand around and think, you know what? I guess God don't probably think this is that much of a sin. It's okay to do this. And God's out there saying, no, it's not okay. Because I take sin seriously. And one day I am going to come back and I'm going to wipe all the sin out of this world. I'm going to bring Eden back to this world. And I'm going to put things back in order the way it should be. And I'm going to destroy it. But it brings comfort to me to remind me that I do have a God who loves justice. That I do have a God who loves and hates sin. But not only does he bring justice, but I love this. He also brings grace. And I love this. Look at verse 20. This is awesome. It says, And a Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from their transgression. That word redeem means to buy something back. He says, I'm going to send my son and he is going to live the perfect life that we can't live. And he's going to be the perfect lamb that we can't be. And I'm going to sacrifice him and I'm going to put him on the cross. And he is going to take on my wrath. And at the cross, you see the justice of God and you see the grace of God come together with one big kiss. You see God bring out justice and grace there at the cross. And when Jesus rose from the grave, it showed that we have hope. It shows that we have eternal life. It shows that we can live and make it through this hopeless world. But if you're here this morning, you're still saying, I understand that Christ paid our debt. I understand God, Christ did that. But I'm just not ready to surrender then you're heading down a hopeless world. You're putting in hope. You're putting something, your hope in something that is not going to bring you happiness. Until we realize that we're sinners, until we realize that we have the problem, until we finally become hopeless, 
that's when we begin to see Jesus. That's when we begin to see God. That's when we begin to turn and trust God. Because here's the problem. Again, when we get in that dark moment in our life, we love to blame everybody else. We get in the darkness of life, we love to bring we we love to blame situations. When we get in the darkness of light, we love to bring uh, blame it on some circumstance. But I want to tell you, you can go to another church, you can go to another business, you can go to another job, you can go to another state, but wherever you go to run from the things that you're mad at or the things that you don't like, I want you to know you're gonna find yourself there. You know why? Because we're sinners. And we can't change nothing. But when we become hopeless and we trust God, we can find hope. And when we as a church begin to realize that we are hopeless people who need Jesus, then God will begin to do something great in our lives. But are we willing to realize and see ourselves as a hopeless creation? Or do we look at ourselves as God himself? Because this morning I'm asking you, and I'm pleading with you this morning. We need people with broken hearts this morning. We need people who are hopeless. We need people to just break and surrender completely to God. Because if God's going to do something great in this church, he needs a broken and contrite people in this house so that he can begin to make a movement for the kingdom of God. So I want to ask you again this morning, where is your hope? Where is your hope? Who are you going to turn to when darkness comes? Who are you pointing fingers at this morning? Who are you blaming this morning? Because wherever that point and fingers are blaming at, I want you to realize that the problem is not them. The problem is not that situation. And Israel realized that. It wasn't God's fault that all this stuff fell off. The problem was they had some sin issues inside of them. And that they needed to repent and turn back to God. Because God needed a movement. He needed people broken. So this morning, I'm going to turn the service over to Brother Mark. And I pray this morning that you come this morning and you see yourself the way God sees you. You see yourself the way God sees you. And you come this morning and you begin to repent. You begin to say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've got issues in my life. God, I know I'm a wreck and I need your help, God. And when you finally begin to put your hope in Christ, God is going to move. I'll tell you, this week's been a tough week for me. I've had a lot of questions. I was a little frustrated, but through this study and through this message, God said, Ron, listen. You've got some situations in your own life that you need to confess to me. You've got transgression. You've got sin that you need to confess. And you do that, and I'll take care of the rest. So this morning, I am challenging you. I am pleading with you. If you've got sin in your life, if you're dealing and you feel hopeless this morning, that's great. If you're hopeless this morning, that's awesome because at the other side of that door, there's Jesus. And he is saying, come to me and give me your burdens. Give me this way and I'll carry it through. So church this morning, if you want to see a movement happen, if you want to see an awakening happen, and if you want to see God do some great things, it begins with confession. If you ever read the study of the great awakening that happened in the United States, One of the coolest things that happened that caused that movement was a guy named Jonathan Edwards. He preached a sermon about sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he challenged the people, he says, listen, we have a God who holds us in his hands and you need to repent. And it showed that morning the church 
full of people came forward and began to weep and cry and confess to God and said, God, we're sorry that we've made a mess of your creation. God, we're sorry that we messed up this thing. And because of that small church up in the New England area, a movement began to move across the United States. And it was such a big movement that it caused the historians to write a big story in our history books. And they called it the Great Awakening. Why? Because people finally saw who they are in the eyes of God. And they began to repent. And they began to sell out to Jesus Christ. So I'm challenging this morning. Don't just be a typical Baptist this morning. But be a person that's completely sold out to Christ. And give your life to Christ. Confess those sins and let's walk out of here. Not people who are hopeless, but people whose heads are up high, who have hope in their life and are waiting to see what God's going to do in this church. Let's be people. Let's be that city that shines on the hill through this community. Let's see God do some great things in this moment as we sing.
invite the ushers to come this time as we get ready to take up this morning's offering. Also, remember this morning, there will be two offering plates. The red plate will be our retirement fund offering plate, and the other one's our regular offering. I'm going to ask um, our building loan. Well, yeah, just put money in it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> what did I say? We have a retirement fund. If you'd like to donate that, we appreciate it. I'm just kidding. We'll just take whatever you want. Just go ahead. It's God's money anyway. You know? I'm just kidding. I want to ask Josh if he'll uh, pray over this offering. You may be seated. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, join us tonight for a coffee and conference. Bring cookies, please, as we will have our uh, monthly uh, business meeting uh, uh, tonight, uh, starting at 6 o'clock. Also, if you see on the back there, we have tiny hands, we have tiny feet, and there's someone new for you to meet. Kellen Drake Cash was born Tuesday, January 31st, 2012. He was 7 pounds eight ounces and uh, 19 and a half inches long, and, and it's the proud parents of uh, Matt and Whitney Cash, so uh, make sure you uh, tell Christy, the new grandmother again, to just how, and Whitney's here, okay, Whitney's here, and just, just go by and see the baby, and just tell them that you're praying for them as they begin this new adventure. Also, uh, there is a lot of other things in here that you need to read, uh, some announcements and stuff that, uh, that I could go through, there's a bunch of announcements, so make sure you read your bulletins this morning. There's announcements in there, so make sure you look over it. And if I missed any important ones, please remind me, and I can tell it out, out real quick, and I'll tell you. But it should be all there in the uh, bulletin. But I'm going to turn this over, so, back over to uh, Brother Mark. Thank you for that wonderful message this morning, Ron. We will have uh, orchestra practice at 4 o'clock. Uh, we're working on some new songs, and we're working on songs for next Sunday. And choir practice at 5, and then we are having the the meeting tonight, and we're uh, electing committees to search for pastor and uh, youth pastor as uh, Ron gets ready to go plant a church in Olympia. So it's a real important night. If you can be there, it would be, it would be spectacular. You, you should be there. Let's, uh, let's stand and sing this wonderful anthem. Lord Jesus Christ, it's been so good to be in your house. It's so good to hear from you. May we go out today in your power and your presence. And live for you, God. Sing. Let the glory. 